Okay, we'll get started. Um, our second speaker is Anthony Shaw. He's the director at Innovation and Tech Talent Development uh, with Dimension Data. And today he'll tell us how to write a container daemon in Python. So please give our hands to Anthony. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, I'm Anthony Shaw, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Python and Docker. So um, just quickly, who's already used Docker? Great, OK. I don't need to do too much explanation about what it is. Um, this is going to be quite a deep technical talk. And basically, the, the idea behind it was um, really about ma a bit of magic. So when I initially thought about Docker and how it worked, it was a bit of a black box. And to me, it was just really a bit of magic. So this is my analogy. This is the sorting hat in Harry Potter. Hopefully, some of you are familiar with this. Um, and the sorting hat does actually run by magic, or at least so people thought. Um, a group of scientists actually um, reverse engineered the docker, the, uh, the hat. Um, and it turns out what happened was that the, the ones actually had an RFID chip in them. So when the wizards actually put the hat on, it activated uh, the sensor underneath the hat. Um, in Ollivander's, basically, they did a background check. They used the Facebook graph query to see your ties to Voldemort, um, and also they did use Experian to do a credit reference on your parents. So um, whilst it does seem like magic, um, and also they used a Furby, sorry, for the talking. Um, so whilst the sorting hat did seem like magic, actually it was just some fairly crude engineering. So I hate to spoil your um, childhood dreams. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk a bit about Docker. and. Things in engineering can't really be magic, because when you deploy them to production, you need to know more or less how they work. So what I decided to do was to try and write Docker in Python and to get a container running from scratch in 100% Python. So I'm going to walk you through that. And at the end, um, I'm going to give you a demo of that working. So what is Docker really? And I've heard a lot of phrases thrown around um, from people trying to simplify what Docker is. Um, people saying, oh, it's just true. Um, it's nothing new. Containerization has been around for ages. Um, you know, Docker is just a brand name on top of existing technologies. Um, it just uses kernel namespaces and C groups. And actually, Docker is all of those things and more. So in this diagram, I'll just walk you through some of the key components um, in Docker. The first one's quite important, actually, and this is the, the Docker can, images themselves. So when you pull a Docker image from the Docker Hub, um, it actually has a set of tarballs in it. And then it uses a union file system, which I'll go into in a second, to extract those layers on top of each other. So that's a pretty neat feature. Um, not unique to Docker. There are other applications which use it. But the way that Docker uses it makes it really easy to consume. So that was the first thing I had to implement. The next bit. Um, <laughs> is a little bit trickier. So this is actually a feature of the Linux kernel. So the process API in Linux um, allows you to um, basically run processes within namespaces. A namespace is a way of isolating specific um, processes in the kernel. So if you fork a process um, in C, or if you open a new process in Python, um, it will just run in the root namespace. So what you can actually do with Linux is you can create a namespace and isolate the process, um, the mount table, uh, into process communication. UTS is just a fancy way of saying the host name, um, and the network as well. So what happens in a Docker container when you run it, it actually isolates all those things at a kernel level. So a running Docker container is really just the process running on the server with some extra padding and constraints around it so that it can't see other processes. So those things come across as a container. There's actually a core feature of the Linux kernel. Um, in networking, there's also some wrappers in Docker for some funky features in IP Route 2, which is part of the Linux um, distribution. These allow you to create virtual Ethernet devices, um, create IP bridges, um, and also do firewalling at runtime as well. So these are also baked into Docker. Next one, um, C groups or control groups. 
So this allows you to say, for a specific process, only allow it to have access to, let's say, 20% of the CPU, or 500 megs of memory. So these C groups, combined with namespaces, um, actually give you a nice way of running a process and almost running it like a virtual machine. So it's got the same kind of constraints in terms of it can't see other processes, it can't access IPC, for example, so it can't communicate with other processes outside of the namespace. Um, and also you've got constraints, so it can't eat up all the memory or the CPU on the box. Um, and then lastly, they've tapped into some of the security features um, like SE Linux, which hopefully some of you may be familiar with. Um, it's the first thing you turn off when you get errors on a new deployment. So. Um, so first things first, let's talk about the storage. So the Union file system that Docker uses is a way of having layers. So if you've used a Docker container before, you'd normally start off with the base layer. So in my analogy, I'm going to use Mr. Potato Head um, to represent our Docker layers. But you start off with a base image, which is normally like a really cut down Linux kernel image, Linux image, sorry. So this is our core OS. Then we stick on top normally some Git binaries, uh, our application files, and a Python runtime. So the key thing about the, the layering system and the union file system is that if you want to swap out a specific piece, you don't have to replace the whole potato. So if we want to swap the 3.6 Python runtime for 3.7 alpha zero, for example, um, you can just swap out the eyes instead of changing the entire potato. So when it comes to patching with Docker, this makes it a lot easier. So I'm going to walk you through some of the packages that I used um, in Python, which actually give you access to those Linux kernel features from Python code. So the, when I initially thought about this, um, the reason was because Docker's been written in Go, and in my head, I thought you would never write something like Docker in Python because Go is like a low-level language. It needs to interact with lots of low-level features. And actually reading into the documentation about these kernel features, they're all presented as C APIs. And it's just as easy to access and call a C API from Python as it is in Go. So why should it be any different? And actually, Different developers have already addressed these problems, not to solve the same issue, but for other reasons. So the first one I came across was for namespaces. So there's actually a package called nsenter. In the top right-hand corner, I've just indicated um, which versions of Python all these packages will run under. Um, nsenter actually allows you to run a start a subprocess within a namespace. So if you've got a network namespace running on the local host, um, this actually happens when you're running a, a Docker container. So if you've got one running already, you can get the process ID of that Docker container. And then within Python, you can actually call processes inside the Docker container from outside it. So if you want to do debugging, as an example, or there's another reason why you might want to hop into a container, I've seen cases where people try and SSH into containers. They do all sorts of crazy things. This is a nice, clean way of doing it from Python. Uh, next thing I looked at was uh, control groups. So um, there's a package again called cgroups. And using the cgroups package, um, you can create control groups on the local Linux host. And you can set constraints around them. In my example, I've set a CPU limit of 50% and I've set a memory limit of 500 megs of memory. Now, there's a, there's a way of accessing this which is not that well documented, not very obvious, but once you know it's there, it's really cool. So when you use the subprocess module and you run popen to start a new process, there's an extra keyword argument called pre-exec function. If you pass it a callable, that callable will be run inside the forked process before it runs the process that you want to run. So you can do all sorts of crazy things inside that callable. And that's where I started to do things like, OK, enter the process which I currently am, which is not the host process, is the new process, and add it to the control group. 
Also, that's where you can do things like enter the network namespace. Um, that's things where you might want to look at um, file handles, for example. So this is a really cool um, Python package which somebody had already written. Sorry, also I've got links to the, the gist as well if you want to just copy out the gist. Um, so yeah, this was another module I found which really helped me along the path. Next one was the networking. So networking in Docker is, is a pretty big um, feature. And in my um, application, which I call Mocha, um, I just started off with a really simple scenario. So it's great that I can start a process, um, that I can set the memory constraints, CPU constraints. I can put it in a namespace so it can't see other processes. So it's effectively a container by this point, but I can't talk to it. So normally, you would run Docker, and you would put something in it which communicates to the network. So Docker have actually implemented a lot of ways of interfacing with um, what's called IP Route 2. Um, if you've ever, ever got into Linux networking in detail, you'd have come across some of the commands. Like if you just type IP on the, um, in bash, then that is actually calling um, some functionality which lets you talk to IP Route 2. So I came across this amazing package called PyRoute 2, which allows you to treat the, the local network configuration as an object instance. And I love this package, it's amazing. It's, you can do all sorts of things. You can talk to local addresses. Um, you can create virtual interfaces. You can change the routing table. Um, so this is really a way that, in the code, what I did was to create a new virtual interface to move it into the new network namespace, and then basically create a bridge between that new network namespace and my host process. So that was just a crude um, setup, which is one of the basic scenarios you would use in Docker. Um, but that was all done using Python. So at the bottom, also, you'll see um, I've added a route so that we've got a default gateway. So it can communicate out, um, hopefully, to the internet. So there's a couple of flaws in the code here. Um, my not very random MAC address, and also the IP that I use. So that was my, that was my setup. Another key thing that happens in, um, in Docker. So once you've got your downloaded image, your Docker, your Docker image, and you want to run it as a container, you've got all those layers which have been stacked on top of each other. So that's the potato head. But that should be the root of the file system. So you don't want the container to still think that the root of the file system is your host. So there's a command, which if you've been a Linux admin before, you might come, come across called chroot. Um, and chroot basically allows you to kind of reset where the root path is. So this can be quite helpful um, if you're doing any diagnostics of remote disks and things in Linux. Um, but in Python, actually, what we can do is, again, that pre-exec function callable, um, we can actually chroot the new process. So what I use this for in Mocha is that once I've downloaded the layers and I've extracted them on top of each other, before I call the process, which might be basically whatever's in the Docker definition, that might be like an Nginx web service, it might be the, the Python binary, then to change the shrew to the new directory. So now we've kind of stacked up a few things. We've set, we've isolated the network. We've isolated the resources. Um, we've isolated IPC. And we've started a new process. And we've started that new process in a route that's unique to that container image. So that, that's all done. And we've more or less built a running container daemon in pure Python. So I'm going to walk you through. Um, the code just quickly. So there's a bunch of import statements. That's not very important. So in total, I think it's uh, 140 lines of code of Python. Um, there's, another, there's two other commands that I'm not going to show you here, but one just pulls the image from the Docker Hub. <laughs> 
Um, instead of writing a union file system in Python, um, the layers in Docker are actually just tarballs. So all I did is just extract the tarballs on top of each other. So it's, it's crude, but it works. Um, so first things first was to come up with a not very random MAC address um, to figure out by reading the Docker file. Um, so when you write a text Docker file, when Docker ingests that, it actually creates a JSON version of that in the local database. So once you have the JSON version, you can read things like, what are the environment variables? What's the start command? Which is basically the, just the container itself. Um, and what directory should the start command be run from? So now the next thing was to create some virtual ethernet adapters and to create a bridge adapter, to create a network namespace, and then to move the new bridge interface into the new network namespace. So IPDB is part of the PyRoute 2 package that I mentioned earlier. Um, and yeah, this package is fantastic. If you ever do any network diagnostics, um, you ever do a lot of networking work, then I'd really recommend checking this out. and then creating the, within the new network namespace. So when you establish, this is basically the, uh, the IP database. So this is like the local configuration. When you instantiate one of these, you can actually specify to zone within a network namespace. So you've created it. Now, I just wanna look at that local interface and you can interact with things like the loopback interface as an object instance. Then we set up the default routes. And then um, we're going to create the C groups, set the CPU and memory limitations. And then I've got that callable that I spoke about earlier. So when we run the pre-exec function, it's going to do a few things to set it up. Um, it's going to move the new process to the C group. It's going to take all of the environment variables, because typically in a Docker file, you would actually add extra environment variables that you want to run in the container. So what I'm just doing here is looping through those and then just saying put EMV, which basically says put that environment variable into the local instance. Um, set the network namespace of the new process. Add the process to the control group, ch root, and then if the user specified a working directory, which they may or may not have done, then change directory to that working directory. And then just a bit of code at the bottom to help me um, debug it when it goes wrong. So, because I don't tend to favor live demos, <laughs> I recorded this in the hallway um, so that I couldn't flat finger it. So this is a new, uh, a new host. So I'm gonna clone the repository. So this is what you can do if you wanna test it out. It has to be Linux, um, and we can talk about why in a minute. So it's called Mocha. Um, clone the repository from GitHub. Go to the new repository, set up a virtual environment. Activate it. Install all the pip requirements. So this is where I've got my C groups package. I've got NSenter, the IP route two package. Um, then I added a new command called images, which just basically lets you see what images you've got installed. This is the same as typing Docker images. So now I'm gonna pull the Nginx image, version 1.11, from the Docker Hub, with some warnings. <laughs> um, and that's where I've basically just extracted them on top of each other. Then lastly, I'm gonna say, okay, what are the images now? And I've got my Nginx image, it's 68 meg, version 1.11, and then mock a run, Library, Nginx. Uh, 
Okay, I'm just going to pause it there. So what it's done is it's created the C groups. Um, I don't know why it's done them. Oh, no, it does them for all users, actually. Uh, you can't disable that. It then runs the process that's specified. This is our new process, which is the Nginx web service. So if you ever use the Nginx container, it's, it's a nice base image you can use to drop an application on, into. So it's now run, spawned from Python, the Nginx daemon within a true inner namespace. And uh, what else? There's something else. Um, and a C group, yeah. And set the C group of the new process. Then we've loaded up all the environment variables, um, like the path variable, for example, and so it knows where to look for logs and where to put things. So it's working. So just in case you don't believe me, <laughs> um, I opened up another, just another tab on that host, list network namespaces, and then IP netNS ex execute, which basically says, execute a new process within that network namespace, run curl. So this is going to run curl within that network namespace to get localhost, OK? Yeah. Works. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> So what was the point in all that? <laughs> um, this was probably a bad idea. Um, Python has this kind of thing that people mention about not being able to run multiple things at the same time. Um, it's great that you can run that one container, um, but I've, all, I've missed hundreds of features that Docker has. My implementation is pretty flaky. Um, it doesn't really get into the whole networking space, which is really complicated. So. Um, yeah, I, I would probably use Docker next time. Um, however, in this process, I've come across some really great packages for helping me debug containers. Um, IP Route 2 um, also is a, is a great package and useful if you're ever doing any work with networking. Um, if you're ever using kind of like white box network devices, which is basically just like the Linux, a small Linux distribution running on some hardware. Um, IP Route 2 is great, and you could build some really cool debugging tools for networks using that. Um, yeah, the NSenter um, new process is a much better way, especially from Python, um, of jumping into a running Docker instance and running a command. Also, if you're ever, caught, if you're ever spawning processes from within Python, then I recommend using control groups to put some constraints around the CPU memory and possibly even put them in a namespace. So for example, if you wanted to spawn a process for some, heaven forbid, user-defined code, <laughs> um, you could use this kind of packaging and um, API to basically isolate that code. Um, and then lastly, there is actually a Docker, uh, well, Docker comes with an API, but there's a Python package to talk to the Docker API. So don't, from Python, spawn the Docker command line process and use that as a way of interfacing to Docker. Use the Docker package, uh, which is on PyPI. I uh, strongly recommend it. It allows you to interface to get information about running instances. Um, if you do want to spawn processes, I'd recommend actually looking at using Docker um, and using containers as a nice way of doing that um, and using the Python library to do so. So you never have to jump back into the normal interface. Yeah, so that's my talk. Um, if you want to follow some of the other projects I've been working on, that's my website. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my handle. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anthony. That was really, really enjoyable. Uh, we have five minutes and 40 seconds for questions, so feel free. We're all really clear. Oh, there's one. <laughs> 
I stopped looking at your Pi 2, Pi 3 icons. Uh, how much of a problem was doing this in, in Python 3? Um, yeah, all of the packages support both. Um, yeah, from, from all the testing and the, what I could see, that all the packages supported both. Um, I ran the demo and the tests and stuff on Python 2.7 um, because I was, the Vagrant image I was using was using that, but yeah, I did, I did go and check those. Anyone else? Okay. You mentioned um, that some of the tools um, that you use might help you debug uh, Docker containers that mm -hmm. you're running locally, perhaps for dev work. Uh, do you have any examples of um, some things you thought that you could perhaps do with mm. those tools? Um, let's think. So, if, for example, if you're running a Django web service um, in a container um, and you wanted to interact with manage.py, um, from so you've already got the you've already got running in dev mode, and you wanted to interact with manage.py as another process, um, you could use ns enter, um, which I had on. Let me just find it. Yeah, this one. Um, so this is the ns enter package. You could use that to say Python manage.py and then whichever command you wanted to use. Yeah. Um, so for when, when you run the uh, sort of doc, Docker um, uh, run, right? Uh, mm -hmm. what, what do you use to map the volumes? Let's say uh, I run it in Windows and then I want to map my uh, path to your doc. How do you interact it inside yeah, using this? That's a really good question. Um, and actually exploring this in detail helped me understand how Docker runs on Windows. Um, because all of the stuff I showed you is part of the Linux kernel. Um, and actually digging into the technicalities of how Docker runs on Windows, it actually runs Linux on Windows first and then runs Docker on Linux. So if, yeah, if you go and read the white papers, it's actually quite interesting about how they've done it. And then they've essentially created a bridge between the, the Docker, uh, the Linux VM running on Windows and the actual Windows host. So they basically create a bridge between the two so you'd never notice that it's there. But the Linux, and there was other announcements about it as well. They also added some kernel shims. Um, so this is when Microsoft added, uh, announced bash support um, and the Ubuntu, I can't remember how they described it now. Yeah, so really they, what they've started to do is extend the Windows kernel and basically put like a, a shim in front of it so it kind of looks like a Linux kernel but only works in certain scenarios. And um, for Docker, the implementation, what they actually did, um, unless it's changed, is that they runs a virtual machine uh, using Hyper-V, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it runs Linux on the virtual machine, it puts Docker on top of it, and then in the host, you get like a little Docker icon that allows you to talk to it, but it's actually hopping into the VM to do that, to do that work. Um, in terms of mounting volumes, I, I never got to that on, the, on this experiment. We still have two minutes for questions. Okay, well, uh, can we put our hands together for Anthony Planks? Thank you. And as the tradition for the conference, 